Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. Today we have another special guest here at Timmy the Toolman Studios. It's this guy Chris who lives in Half Moon Bay which is on the coast of California. We met Chris at our last party and he had a job that he thought we might be interested in. Yeah. The job Chris has for us is he wants to install a bushing sleeve that comes from East Coast Gear Supply. If you've never heard of East Coast Gear Supply, they are a very popular company to use when you're choosing to have work done in your differentials, whether it's having a re-gear done or maybe you're getting a locker installed. They are a very reputable company that a lot of people trust with their differentials. What is this bushing that we're talking about? For lifted Toyota SUVs and trucks, what people have found is they'll end up getting a vibration or a roaring sound coming from the front end. They think maybe it's the CV axle or it's the differential or maybe it's a drive shaft. But what the culprit usually ends up being is the fact that on the driver's side, there's a needle bearing that the CV shaft slides into. Here's a CV shaft. This is the side that connects up to the hub of the wheel. And this is the side that goes into the differential. This slides in and this rides on a needle bearing. There's a problem with the front differential carriers that Toyota makes that East Coast Gear Supply found out about is there's a problem with the interface of the spider gear and the carrier. The carrier that Toyota makes is a cast piece and the area that the spider gear sits in is not machined to have a nice fit with the spider gear. So that spider gear can slop around in there a little bit more than say another manufacturer that made a nice machine surface for that spider gear to sit in. So that's the number one problem that there's a little bit of extra play in that spider gear. When you lift up the truck, the CV angle is gonna be more extreme. So instead of being at a slight angle, it's gonna be more bent like this. And it's putting more pressure on that needle bearing. And the needle bearing wasn't really meant to take that kind of force. And so what ends up happening is the needle bearing starts to fail and then you get the vibration because there's excessive play and you might get that roaring sound. What East Coast Gear Supply did for us is they came up with a oil impregnated bronze bushing. What that bushing does for you, it takes up the excess slop on the driver's side of the differential. On their website, they have a little video. We'll put a link to their website so you can watch the same video. but. They put the CV shaft into a Toyota carrier and then they have a dial indicator and they show how much movement there is in the shaft. It was 50 thousandths. East Coast Gear Supply installed the bushing that they made and they retested the fit of the CV axle into the carrier. That play went from 50 thousandths down to 8 thousandths, so a lot less play. That bushing that they made is supposedly good for the life of the vehicle. Now it's some conjecture on their part, but they think it could last for 500,000 miles. Basically, you should never have to replace this bushing once you install it. The other thing that they did with this bushing is they made it a little bit longer than the actual needle bearing. It's a quarter inch longer, and what that does is it helps support the CV axle a little bit better. Now that we explained to you what the problem is with the Toyota carriers and how East Coast Gear Supply found a fix for it, let's show you the parts that Chris bought for this job. Here is the bushing that East Coast Gear Supply makes. It's got two distinct sides to it. This is the side that faces the wheel. This is the side that goes into the differential. The way that this is made is this is a steel sleeve that's encompassing the oil impregnated bronze bushing. The reason for the two sides is this has a steel lip to it and this is the side that you're going to be driving with a tool to drive it into the differential. So that's why they make it like that with only one way to go in. This right here is the tool that East Coast Gear Supply sells to remove the needle bearing. This little top piece goes behind the needle bearing and then you put the face of this plate against the end of the differential, you start tightening the screw and it draws the needle bearing out. If you run into problems and the whole screw is turning on you, they give you another nut so you can double nut it to lock the nuts in place so this thing won't spin to where you can then finish the job of drawing the needle bearing out. East Coast Gear Supply also sells a driver kit so you can drive in the bushing. This is just a basic seal driver kit that you can get at different places. Harbor Freight makes one, OTC makes another one. You don't necessarily have to buy 
this kit from East Coast Gear Supply if you already own a seal driver kit or you decide you're just gonna pick one up at another place. Harbor Freight makes a seal driver kit that's plastic. You don't want that one, you want the metal one. So here's a similar kit made by OTC. It's part number 4507. As you can see, it looks very similar to the kit that East Coast Gear Supply sells. Pretty much the same size drivers, similar handle. So this is another option if you wanted to buy one from OTC. And I'll put a link in the video description to this kit. Other things that you'll want to have on hand is some gear oil for your front differential because you are going to lose a little gear oil we're gonna be jacking up just the driver's side, so we're not gonna lose the whole capacity. But if your gear oil is really old, this is the time to drain it all the way out, then fill it up with some fresh gear oil. Other things that you might wanna do at the same time since the CV shaft is out, say for instance you detected a gear oil leak in your front end, and you determined that the axle seal on the driver's side was leaking, this is the time to pull that seal and install a new one. We have a video showing you how to do that. If you click on the link above, you can follow that tutorial to replace your front differential oil seals. Another thing that would be a good thing to do at the same time, say you have a torn CV axle boot. You got the CV axle out already, so go ahead and reboot it. We have a video for that, and that video also shows a boot stretch mod for lift the trucks. So click on the link above for that video. Finally, since you are disconnecting the knuckle and you have to disconnect the lower ball joint to do that, this might be a time to renew your lower ball joints because the lower ball joints have been known to fail on these rigs and when it does, it can cause a lot of damage and potentially cause you to wreck your vehicle. I think I blah blah enough there. We are gonna get the truck jacked up and get the driver's side front wheel off and we're gonna get going on this repair. We're ready to get started on this job. We have the front end jacked up, supported with a six ton jack stand on the driver's side frame rail. Then we have the two rear tires chalked because we are at a little bit of an angle, just partially in my garage. We removed the front skid plate. You have to get the skid plate out of your way so it's easier to get the CV axle out. And it will be also easier for you to fill the front differential with some gear oil. To start off, Chris and I are on the driver's side He's got his hand on the driver's side CV axle and we're going to show you the type of play we're talking about that can cause the vibration or the roaring noise from the front end of your vehicle. So you can see that movement. That is some pretty gross movement. We move the passenger side and the passenger side wiggles a little bit but not quite as much play as that. So it seems to me that his needle bearing might be shot. and. It probably took some excessive wear due to the lift of his forerunner, and so that's why we're doing this job. Chris said that he is experiencing the symptoms that East Coast Gear Supply talked about. At speeds of 50 miles an hour or higher, he is getting a roaring noise. So that's how Chris diagnosed the problem, and he has experience doing this job because he used to own a first-gen Tacoma, and he did this repair on his Tacoma. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this dust cover off so we can expose the axle nut so we can get it off. If you bought your rig used, it's very common to find this dust cover dented up because the mechanic or the do-it-yourselfer guy didn't know how to properly get this off. So if you use the right succession of tools or the right technique, you don't have to mangle this thing. So what Chris is gonna start off with is this skinny little wedge tool that I have if you didn't have something like this, you can use a skinny screwdriver to get a little bit of a gap in between the dust cover and the face of the hub. So what Chris did is he just worked around the whole circumference getting a slight gap. Now he's gonna transition to a medium sized coal chisel and get a bigger gap. And now he's going to finish up by going to the larger coal chisel and get it off. He's got a nice gap between the dust cover and the face of the hub. Now he's just going to grab a pry bar and pop it off. And there we go. The dust cover's off and we didn't mangle it. Chris is just using a needle nose pliers, straightening out the cotter pin, and then he's going to get it out the rest of the way with a pair of dykes. 
There you go. All right, the cotter pin's out of the way. Now you can slide that special washer off. Now how you go about the next step depends on your tools. If you have an impact gun like we have, we can just zip off that 35 millimeter axle nut, no problem. If you don't have an impact gun, you could have a friend or a family member step on the brake, which is gonna hold the rotor steady. You get on here with a 35 millimeter socket with a big breaker bar and you break it loose. A third option, if you're by yourself and you don't have any friends because you're not very popular, you put the tire back on, you lower the vehicle down to the ground, and now the tire is gonna be holding everything firm while you again get on here with a 35 millimeter socket and a big breaker bar and you break it loose. So those are three ways you can get this done. And just like that, it's off. We need to be able to move this knuckle out of our way and get the CV axle out. There's two things that we have to disconnect so we can swivel the knuckle out of the way. The first one we're gonna work on is we're gonna get the outer tie rod disconnected from the knuckle of the ball joint. Chris is gonna have to straighten out the cotter pin and get the cotter pin out of his way. He got the cotter pin straightened out. Now he's just working it the rest of the way out with a pair of dikes. Okay, the cotter pin's out. Now he's gonna get onto the castle nut with a 19 millimeter impact socket. Using my DeWalt gun, he's gonna zip it off. Now we're gonna get a puller in place and we're gonna break free the outer tie rod from the knuckle of the ball joint. Some people prefer the big effing hammer technique. They hammer on this to break it free. I prefer puller, so Chris is gonna get a puller in place here. What you wanna make sure is that the tines of the puller are in between the boot and the knuckle of the ball joint so you don't damage the boot. There's also another known technique using a pickle fork, but if you want to save your components, like this outer tie rod, a pickle fork will just destroy this, so we don't suggest using pickle forks either. Use pullers. He's gonna drive down with this ratchet on this rod, puts pressure on the top of the rod of the outer tie rod, and then it's gonna break it loose. Wow, that wasn't on there tight. Chris recently changed these outer tie rods so they really weren't that strongly bonded to the knuckle of the ball joint. The next thing we're gonna break free is the lower ball joint from the lower control arm. So again, we have to get the cotter pin out first and then zip out the castle nut. And that castle nut is a 24 millimeter castle nut. All right, that was easy. So he got the cotter pin out of the way and we're gonna use our gun and he's gonna zip off that 24 millimeter castle nut. Now we gotta get another puller in place and we're gonna break free the lower ball joint from the lower control arm. The same precautions apply with this application using a puller. You wanna make sure the tines of the puller are in between the boot of the ball joint and the lower control arm so you don't damage the boot. Chris is just gonna tighten up the rod. The rod is pushing up against the spindle of the lower ball joint and we're gonna break it free. And again, because he recently did work on the front end of his vehicle, it broke free really easily. The next thing we're gonna do is kind of a two-person operation. Chris is gonna start lifting the knuckle up off of the lower control arm while he's pushing this through. If this fights you, like if you haven't changed the CV axle in a while or done any front end work, you might have to pound on this with either a brass hammer or a plastic hammer to get it started pushing through the hub. We're gonna carry this over to this side. I have some bailing wire hanging here. He's gonna move it over to me, hold it here, while I bailing wire it off to the side to where we have room to work to get the CV axle out. We have it pulled over pretty nicely back towards the rear of the vehicle. And then now, as you can see, we have a nice clean shot to be able to get the CV axle out and get it back in and also do the necessary work to get the needle bearing out and the bushing in. We're gonna pop out the CV axle from the front differential. There's more than one technique to break free the CV axle from the differential. What you're trying to overcome is there's a C-clip on the end of the shaft that hooks into the 
differential and you're trying to overcome that. Sometimes you could pry right in between this lip of the CV axle and the differential and you could break it free. My technique that I like to use is I like to use a, a long pry bar. I put the edge of the pry bar on the edge of this lip and then you hit this direction and you pop it out. How I can help Chris, because he's going to be doing the hammering, is I'm going to be holding the opposite end of the shaft parallel to the ground. Because when the CV axle is parallel to the ground, it's much easier to knock it out to get that clip free. Since we didn't drain the differential gear oil, we have a pan underneath the CV axle. So as the shaft comes out and any gear oil starts to spill out, it's going to spill into the catch container. So like I said, I'm on the other side of the CV shaft. I'm going to hold this parallel. Now Chris is going to start pounding on that flange of the inner joint and hopefully we're just going to knock this thing right out. Okay, it's free. And I'm just going to carefully carry this out and set it down. Now that we have the CV axle out of the front differential, you can see a few things. This is the driver's side front differential oil seal. Right behind it is the needle bearing. I'm swiveling it right now with my finger and that's what we're going to be pulling out. The directions that East Coast Gear Supply give you say to stuff something back behind the needle bearing because you first have to get that little nut placed right behind the needle bearing so you can grab it and pull it out. The fear is if you don't have anything stuffed behind there, you might end up pushing that into the differential then you're going to have to go fishing for it with a magnet. We tried to stuff a gallon size bag in there but it's just a little bit too much material. We're switching to a quart size bag and we're going to see how that goes. Chris was able to get the quart size sandwich bag back behind the needle bearing and then now what we have to do is we have to get that special nut that comes with the extraction tool behind the needle bearing. So here's that nut I'm talking about. It has two distinct sides and when East Coast Gear Supply made their video they have this flatter side going directly behind the needle bearing and this side with the protrusion is facing inboard towards the differential. The way you get it in place is you use some type of magnet. I have this little telescoping magnet. What Chris is going to do is he's going to utilize the magnet to fit it back in there and get it behind the needle bearing. The video that East Coast Gear Supply shows for this application says that this nut fits a little bit tight behind there so don't be surprised if you get it in place you get it in there at an angle and then you have to pop it the rest of the way maybe with a screwdriver or a brass drift to pop it to where it's now fully against both sides of the rear of the needle bearing we have it placed in there and like the east coast gear supply direction say you might have to tap it in so we have it in there at an angle and it's just not fitting in there so i have a brass drift with a little ball peen hammer and I'm going to see if I could pound it the rest of the way back. Oh, that's not going in, huh? Mm -mm. We ran into a lot of problems getting this nut behind the needle bearing. He did a little grinding to the nut to make it easier to get in. I'm going to let him explain what exactly he ground down. We are going to grind down this corner right here because that's where it's hitting in the needle bearing. You can kind of see the marks that we were trying to bang it in and it would not go in very easily. I'm going to grind down this corner and I'm also going to grind down this corner a tiny bit. Here we go. All right, so this is how far we grinded it down. We're going to try this and see if it works and we'll grind it more if need be. We had a very difficult time getting that extractor nut behind the needle bearing. The first grinding we did didn't work. Chris had to resort to taking a little bit of the length off on each end. But you have to be really careful how much you take off because the length of the nut is pretty much the perfect length of the diameter of this needle bearing. So if you get a little bit too overzealous and take off too much material, 
then you're not going to be able to grab the needle bearing from behind and pull it out. You just have to take a little bit off, test fit it. Take another little bit off, test fit it. Because we were hammering pretty hard. At one point, we got a pry bar on here thinking just a little bit more force would knock it in place. And that still didn't do it. With a couple heavy hammer blows, we were worried that we were going to actually damage the backside of the needle bearing and push it into the gap that we need for this nut. So we stopped and we ground a little bit more. And Chris was finally able to get it behind there. This is super confusing because when you watch the video on East Coast Gear Supply, they didn't struggle like this and they obviously didn't have to cut down their tool a little bit but we're finding that no matter how much we try to knock it in place with its current length we could not do it we had to take a little bit of the length off so now we're gonna get the rest of the extractor tool in place screw in the rod with the plate on and we're gonna pull this needle bearing out he's threading the rod into the nut that's behind the needle bearing. When you're trying to get the rod screwed into the nut behind the needle bearing, the whole nut is gonna wanna start spinning on you behind the needle bearing. So what Chris did is he was able to get the rod started a little bit, then he pulled backwards towards this direction to pull the nut against the needle bearing so then he can turn it in further without the nut kind of spinning along with it. Now he's got the rod screwed in pretty far into that nut to where it's gonna hold. And now he's just turning this nut and bringing this plate up against the differential face. So now that he has the nut firmly against the plate, now he's gonna start tightening that nut and that's gonna start drawing the needle bearing out of the differential. We found that that nut is a 22 millimeter size, so he's gonna use a 22 millimeter open end wrench. Chris has the needle bearing bottomed out on the face of that plate, and it's still just barely in there so he's just taking a pry bar on each end and just wiggle it out a little bit more. There it is. It was basically right there on the lip. So here's the needle bearing. Here's the nut that we got behind the needle bearing and that's the plate that was going up against the face of the differential. So that's how we're able to get it out. We're now gonna get this off and show you how much material we took off of this to make it work. So originally, Chris took a little bit of material off here, ground it out at an angle, and then he did the opposing side. Doing the opposing side was a mistake. You shouldn't do that because this was going to be our face that's going to go up against the back of the needle bearing, and we messed up and we shouldn't have took material there. After doing that, we still couldn't get this nut behind the needle bearing. So then we ground down on this side, thinking that if we create a little more room, we can pivot it into place behind the needle bearing. That still didn't work. Even by taking a pry bar with some pretty hard strikes, it still wasn't getting in position. So then Chris took a little bit of material off each edge. And that finally did the trick. You have to be really careful how much you take off. We definitely had to alter this tool to make it work. And we think that probably what your first technique should be is to first just take off a little bit of material off each edge, just barely with a grinder, and then try to fit it in there. Chris and I are both of the opinion that the first grinding we did to put an angle on the nut probably didn't do a whole lot for us because what was hanging us up was that this edge right here, the longest section, was just jamming up against the needles and we couldn't push it past. It just was hitting really hard and actually making marks on the end of the nut. Not until we took a little bit of material off each edge were we able to get it on. So that's basically what we suggest. Grind a little bit down on each edge and then try to fit it in. If you can't knock it in, take just a tiny bit more and then try it. You just gotta be real careful and incremental and don't take off too much to begin with. We're gonna let East Coast Gear Supply know about our experience, but what's weird is that this tool has been out for a while and 
we tried and tried and tried and couldn't get it so we would assume other people would have the same experience as we did we just could not get the sucker in place so i'm going to talk to east coast gear supply and tell them what we did and see what they say and maybe they'll alter the tool so other people will just have a straightforward application and they don't have to break out a grinder or maybe a file to file a little bit of the length of this nut off now that we got the needle bearing finally out of there it took a while and a little bit of cursing don't forget to get whatever you stuffed on the interior of the differential out because that would be a bad thing and you probably wouldn't be able to get your cv shaft in anyways we're going to use a needle nose pliers and chris is going to grab a hold of the bag and pull it out of the differential and there we go now we're ready to get the bushing into the differential here's the bushing and it's really cold because it's been sitting in the freezer for a couple hours this is a trick that chris reminded me about if you put something in a freezer it will shrink it up a little bit and make it easier for insertion so again, remember that this has two distinct sides. It has a steel face side and then a side without the steel face. This is the side that's gonna be facing the outside of the vehicle. And so Chris is gonna grab his press sleeve and he's gonna drive it into the differential in this fashion. The key to this is you wanna make sure that you're driving it in squares. Get the bushing started into the differential and just eyeball it, make sure that it's going in nice and square and then start pounding away. Take a look at this situation. We got our seal driver, but look how much room we have to strike. You only could do very short strikes with a small hammer, and we couldn't get it started. So what we did to get the bushing started is Chris was holding the bushing in his left hand. He struck it with a brass hammer on the edges to start it driving into the differential because if you go directly to the seal driver, it's hard to tell if you're getting the bushing in started square. So once we got it in just a little bit and it looked like it was driving in really square, we then went to the seal driver. With a small ball peen hammer and with a short throw, we couldn't really start getting it driven in. Chris came up with a good idea. We basically made our tool a little bit longer. I got this big brass drift. If you didn't have something like this, maybe you can use like a half inch drive extension. Something to hammer on to basically to where I could hammer way back from here with some good hard blows as opposed to the short blows that you have to do when you haven't extended it. So this seems to be working for us. Now let's check. Still got a little bit. Okay. Check it. Yep, I think maybe just like one more blow. Check it. Yep. A little more? Yeah. That seems just about right. So you want to hit it a couple more times? Let me or? try hitting it a, a one or two more times. Okay. Yeah, I think the lip that it sits on is really hard to get past is what he sounded like. Yeah. So. That's feeling really solid. I yeah, think that's. That's it. Is that it? That's it for certain. We're finally done driving the bushing into the differential. From experience, Chris remembers that the face of the bushing sticks out a little bit from this ring inside the differential. It's barely anything, maybe, God, if I had to take a measure, maybe like a 16th of an inch, possibly. A very little bit amount. And also, while I was pounding it in, you can feel when the bushing is giving, giving, and then just like driving a seal home or other things, when it hits the end of its travel, it goes from like feeling like a little bit easy to feeling really solid and you could feel that your strikes aren't going anywhere and it's a really solid feeling and a solid sound. Another thing that East Coast Gear Supply mentions is that there's a lip that the bushing will bottom out on and that's what we bottom out at. If you keep hitting on it like there's no tomorrow, 
you could push past that lip. When you hit significant resistance, you hear the difference in the sound, you feel solid, stop. Don't keep on hammering and try to get that completely flush because it's not always going to get completely flush based off of what East Coast Gear Supply said. They said that the lip is a little bit different on the differentials that they're not all exactly the same so you might get a flush you might not get a flush now we're going to get the cv shaft into the differential toyota gives a helpful hint if you get the c-clip with the opening facing downward it supposedly is easier to get it into the differential so i'm going to slide it through here and pass it off to chris and he's going to get it started in the splines of the differential did you feel it slide in a little bit? Yep. Okay. Should be good to go. The lip that we use to drive the CV out of the differential is the same lip we're going to use to drive the CV shaft back in. You get a big long pry bar. This is a, probably a two footer. You slide it in there and you get it onto the lip of that inner tulip. Chris is holding this again parallel to the ground because it makes it easier. And I'm going to give a couple blows with a hammer. That's it. It's in? Yep. Now that we got the CV shaft back in the differential, we're checking the play, and there is absolutely no play like we had before. I can't move this thing at all. And usually, you can grab this and slide it in and out a little bit, but there is no movement at all. This is a super, super tight fit. This is what the East Coast Gear Supply bushing does for you. It tightens up this connection of the CV shaft into the differential makes it pretty much a very, very tight tolerance. We have the CV shaft in. Now we're going to loosen up the bailing wire holding the knuckle off to the side here. And we are going to slide the shaft into the hub and then get the lower ball joint dropped into the lower control arm. Okay, you're free. Okay, so now he's going to Grab the CV shaft in one hand while holding the rotor and the knuckle, and he's gonna slide the end of the shaft into here first. Now that he's got that in there, he can try to line up the ball joint with the lower control arm. If you run into trouble dropping the spindle of the lower ball joint into the lower control arm, what you can do is just get the hydraulic jack right underneath the end of the lower control arm jack up a little bit to where you can get the castle nut started. Go ahead. Okay, a little more. With the assistance of the jack, now we can get the castle nut started. It started a few threads. Now we can get the jack out of our way. Now Chris is just gonna get a half inch drive with the 24 millimeter socket and tighten up that castle nut. Chris is going to torque this ball joint castle nut to 105 foot-pounds. Now, if we're lucky, the hole on the spindle is going to line up with one of the slots in the castle nut. Let's see if we got lucky. If you find out that the slots in the castle nut don't line up with the hole in the spindle, go tighter. Do not go looser. That might be it right there. It's a little more. Try that. We got a fresh cotter pin. The cotter pin that fits most tightly through this hole is a really long one. So what we're going to do is we're going to bend it over and then we're going to cut a little bit of the excess off. Watch your eyes when you cut these so they don't go flying into your eyes. Now he's just going to bend this other end back towards this direction. Okay, there we go. We've got the castle nut torqued 105 foot pounds and we got a brand new cotter pin in place. Now we're gonna get the outer tie rod connected to the knuckle of the ball joint and then torque it to spec. The spec is 67 foot pounds and then get a fresh cotter pin on too.
okay he's got it torqued to 67 foot pounds and then now he's gonna see if the hole lines up on this castle nut so it's not lining up so he's gonna go a little bit tighter to get the slot in the castle nut lined up with the spindle hole So he's got a fresh cotter pin in and he's just going to bend it over the top of the nut and maybe cut off a little bit of excess because it's a little bit long. Okay, we have the outer tie rod connected to the knuckle of the lower ball joint and now we're next going to work on getting the axle nut on and torque to spec. Okay, he's just going to get the 35 millimeter nut on hand tight. And if the CV shaft wasn't fully bottomed out on the back side, it's just slowly going to pull in. So now it seems like he's got it bottomed out on the back side. This is a high torque value. It's 174 foot pounds. So here's the time where it's nice to have a buddy or a family member helping you out. I'm going to jump in his forerunner. I'm going to apply the brakes that's going to lock this rotor from moving. And then he's going to torque this to 174 foot pounds. Something to note is that because that's a high torque value, you got to make sure that you have a torque wrench that goes that high. So this torque wrench goes to 250 foot pounds. Now Chris is going to get the cage over the nut and then line it up to where you can get a fresh cotter pin in. So you basically just line up this special washer to where you can get the slots looking pretty good lined up for the new cotter pin. And that looks like it's going to line up okay, so he's going to get a fresh cotter pin in. He's going to trim a little bit of this off so we can push this inside. All right, we have the axle nut on, torque to spec with a fresh cotter pin. Now we're going to get the dust cover back in position. So you just get the dust cover in as square as you can and you take a plastic mallet. I wouldn't suggest using a, a steel hammer. Just use something that's soft, like a rubber mallet or a plastic hammer to knock it in position. So you look around the whole circumference, making sure it's flushly against the hub, and you're done. If you happen to have wheel spacers, then the next step is to get the spacer on, and I'm gonna do the same thing for Chris. I'm gonna get inside the vehicle, apply the brakes, to keep the rotor from spinning and he's going to torque the nuts for his spacer to 85 foot-pounds. Chris used a tightening pattern of crisscrossing or star pattern. He started on one side, crossed over and kept on crossing until he brought them all up to the spec of 85 foot-pounds. That's just good practice when you're tightening a spacer on or you're tightening a wheel on. Now Chris is just gonna get the wheel on and we're gonna torque the wheel lug nuts to the same spec, 85 foot-pounds. He's got all the lug nuts cinched up. Now we're gonna lower the vehicle to the ground and then torque the lug nuts to 85 foot-pounds. Before we close out this video, I wanted to give you a close-up of what this needle bearing looks like. You have the outer casing and then you have all these little needle bearings around the whole circumference. And you could see it. it's not a real burly thing and this is probably the problem with the extra slop of how the spider gear interfaces with the carrier. It's gonna put extra pressure on this needle bearing which isn't like the most stout looking thing. So the bushing improves upon that and makes the tolerances a lot tighter and the bushing is a lot more durable than this needle bearing. Here's another thing to note. This is the back side that we got the tool behind. And you'll see this lip of the outside casing of the needle bearing got pushed out. And it's clear to us that we got this nut in like so. Pretend this is the back side of the bearing. This side got dented in. And then as this rotates into position, because it's such a tight fit, it caught the lip of the needle bearing cage and pulled it out. Once you finally get this nut behind the needle bearing, give it like a 90 degree turn to where now you're going to be grabbing on really solid piece of the needle bearing as opposed to the damage section that you damaged as you were driving the nut past it. 
Better to have it on a non-damaged lip of the needle bearing as opposed to these damaged sides. Drive the nut in position, give it a 90 degree turn, and then you'll be on a much more solid piece of the needle bearing. We took his forerunner for a test drive and the bushing fixed his problem. He doesn't have the vibration and he doesn't have the roaring noise that are two telltale signs that that needle bearing is needing to be replaced and the fix is using a bushing instead of the needle bearing to help tighten up the tolerances so you don't have that play in the CV shaft and you get rid of the issue. All right, Chris and I didn't anticipate a fight because when you look on the East Coast Gear Supply website and you watch the little video, it didn't look like it was that hard to get that nut, this sucker, behind the needle bearing. You see him tap it a few times with a little ball peen hammer and the thing just slides in place. I'm gonna talk to East Coast Gear Supply and I hope that they don't get mad at me for this video, but I really think that this nut needs to be redesigned just a tiny bit. If they take a little bit of material off each edge, this is gonna be able to slide in position much easier. We gave it the old college try. We tried and tried and we tried some more. And then we even got a big breaker bar with some strong strikes and we still could not pop this all the way in, in position. And we did have the first edge all the way seated, bottomed out as far as it can go, and we could not get this to rotate and plop back behind the bearing. We could not get it. So Chris did the smart thing. He put it on a grinder wheel, and he ground down a little bit of the outside. Now remember, we did put a little chamfer on these edges, but we don't really think that's necessary. What's really necessary is taking a little bit of the length off of each edge. Not a lot, just a barely a little bit. So what we suggest is you grind it down just a tiny bit on each side, get it in the differential, check it and see if it looks like it's gonna be really close to being popped in. If it needs a little more, just a tiny little bit more until it gets almost there and you think, okay, I can get my brass drift and my hammer in position and knock it home. And finally, Chris was able to get this sucker behind there. Now for getting the bushing in, even though we put the bushing in the freezer to shrink the molecules it still is a super tight fit in the differential and we showed there's very little room between the lower control arm and your tool to get a good strike so chris came up with a really smart idea i have a long pretty big brass drift we basically extended the seal driver tool to where i can now hammer from a position where I can get stronger strikes with the hammer. While Chris was paying attention that the face of the driver was evenly against the bushing, he was holding this brass drift against the other driver. And so I can just pay attention to my strikes and give even strikes. And finally, we got it driven all the way in and we were done with that part. I wish I could say that this is a job you can do on your own, but from what I saw and what Chris and I experienced, I really think get a buddy to help you out, especially for the time where you're driving that bushing in. It really helps to have somebody to hold whatever extension, whether this is a half inch drive socket extension, or if you have a brass drift like this, to hold the two together while you can just concentrate on driving it in with a hammer it's gonna make it a lot easier. If you don't have a friend helping you, then you're gonna probably struggle with this, uh, I guarantee it. Either in a pinned comment or in the video description, I'll let you know what East Coast Gear Supply thinks about the suggestion I'm gonna make about this nut being just milled down a little bit more to where it's easier to insert it. If you buy the special tool, the special tool shouldn't fight you this much. I hope they take my suggestion and mill this down just a little bit more so future people trying to do this job aren't gonna have to in the middle of the repair either file it down or get on their grinder wheel to grind it and make it work better for them with all that said we thank you for watching Toyota time with Timmy the tool man and Sean and special guest Chris thank you for watching thank you for subscribing if you have any questions or comments do that below take care bye bye Sigma.